Shalom, it's Brother LeVar coming back at you guys again, again with another topic. And today I'm going to speak on the temple in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The temple in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, is it literal or figurative? The reason why I decided to talk about this today is because for one, I'm familiar with with this particular passage of scripture and what it's really talking about and i'm hearing people mess it up i'm hearing brothers out here with these doctrines in their head trying to connect this stuff back to daniel chapter 8 and daniel chapter 9. we had a brother come in on our broadcast one sabbath and tried to give us this whole spill and prophecy trying to link second thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 and he basically was trying to push on us a doctrine about how the Jews over there in Palestine today are going to be responsible for building a literal third temple. Too many problems with this. We're going to jump right into this. Let's pick it up at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. This is Paul talking about future times, all right? He says, don't be troubled. Let's pick it up at verse 3. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Again, this is talking about the future. He's talking about a big falling away shall come first, which means apostasy from the faith, right? And he says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, this is clear that Paul is talking about a man that's going to come in the future that's going to be deceiving people, okay? And he's going to be revealed, and he's called the son of perdition. And this one is simply who is doomed to go to hell. That's who the son of perdition is. And he says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, the brother was trying to tell us, see, during this period of time that there's going to be a literal temple built and that this man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to go in there, okay, and he's going to be ruling in that particular temple. Now, throughout the course of this teaching, I'm going to show and prove that this is not talking about a literal temple. That's my whole spiel I'm trying to get you guys to understand in this teaching, from my understanding, okay? Let's go to Exodus 25 and 1. I don't believe that's a literal temple, and I'm going to show you why. You guys got to understand something. The Most High has order. He's not going to ask fake Jews to build no temple. That's number one. Exodus 25 and 1, we're going to read verse 1 through 2, and we're going to skip down to verse 8. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering, and let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. What we have to understand is that the first qualifier for building a temple is God commanding it to be built. Number two, the children of Israel have to build it. And the people that are living over there in Jerusalem today are not real Hebrew Israelites. And I know people want to argue about that, but I don't believe these people are Israelites. These people don't believe in the Messiah. There's a whole host of reasons why I don't believe, and we already know that these people are Europeans. These people are not of Shemitic origin, period. 
and history tells you that. Let's go to Exodus 29 and 44. It says, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. You see here, it has to be sanctified by the Most High. If they call themselves building a temple over there, that stuff ain't sanctified because the Most High ain't sanctioned it. Now we're going to go to the book of Joshua, okay? And I'm not going to read all of the passage in Joshua chapter 22, but the context of it is Manasseh, son of Joseph, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh separated themselves and tried to build their own altar. And when the other tribes heard of what they did, they went to make war with them because it was an act of rebellion to the Most High. But we're going to pick it up at Joshua 22 and 16. It says, Thus said the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that ye have built you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord? You got to understand, by them doing this, God would have been upset with all the Hebrews. Why? Because God did not command this altar to be built. You, you got to understand that. So when brothers sit up here and talk about this third temple being built, you have to understand that that third temple is not going to be built until the Messiah is ruled, until all of Israel is gathered, okay? Now let's go to after the kingdom has split to the northern tribes of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And let's read about Jeroboam and what he did in 1 Kings. Let's go to 1 Kings 12 and 32. It says, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. See, look what he had did. He made an altar. He made up his own feast days and he made an altar. Okay? And he sacrificed unto calves that he had made. This man was making idols. You got to understand something. This was an act of rebellion to the Most High also. Look what it says in verse 33. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. He did this on his own accord. If people are over there in Israel today trying to plan on building a third temple, this is something they devised in their own heart. This was not sanctioned by the Most High God of Israel. Okay? Now let's go to John chapter 10. Okay? And let's look at what the Bible says about the temple. Because what people don't understand is there's two distinct words in the New Testament. Two Greek words for the word temple. Let's look at the temple in John chapter 10 and verse 23. It says, And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Right? This is a literal temple. And look what the Greek word it gives. It gives in the lexicon in Strong's Greek 2411, Heron. It's the Greek word Heron. And it says, a sacred place, a temple used as of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, used of the temple at Jerusalem. Because when you read about the people who worship Artemis at Ephesus, the same word comes up because it was a literal place that was built in which they used to serve their gods too. It's a literal temple. That's the whole point. Huron is a literal temple. There's no definition in this word that implies anything figurative. That's the whole point. Look at what it says under the word temple right here. For Huron, the word temple in the New Testament with respect to the temple at Jerusalem often referred to the entire precinct, which included the sanctuary, courts, and other buildings. Okay? 
This is under the lexicon Huron. It's a literal temple, whether it be a pagan temple or the temple that our Lord and Savior walked in on Solomon's porch. All right. Now, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 3 and we're going to read this again. We're going to read 3 and 4 again. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called god or that is worship so that he as god sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is god once again we read about the son of perdition sitting in this temple of God. Let's look at the word translated temple in this verse. And it's in the Greek, 3485, and it gives a word, neos. Look at the definitions. Number one, use of the temple at Jerusalem, but only of the sacred edifice or sanctuary itself, consisting of the holy place and of the Holy of the Holies. In classical Greek, it is used as sanctuary or cell of the temple, where the image of God was placed, which is distinguished from the whole enclosure. So it's talking about the Holy of Holies, right? And we all know nobody can enter there except for if you're a priest or you die. Any heathen temple or shrine, right? Look at definition number three. Metaphorically, the spiritual temple consisting of the saints of all ages joined together by and in Christ. This is talking about the saints. This word naos is given in this verse, not Huron. Huron was specifically talking about something literal. Naos gives this metaphoric definition. Why? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The word translated temple here is naos. You are the temple of God. This is, metaphorically speaking, in spiritual terms, you are the temple of God. So when it says that this son of perdition, or this man of sin, that opposeth and exalt himself above all that is God or all that is worship and he sits in the presence or sits in the temple of God is talking about him sitting in the presence of the saints that's what he's going to be doing this is not talking about a literal temple because as I've stated before these people who are trying to set up a third temple in Israel are not true Jews. Let's go to one more. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, and it says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people and the word translated temple here in both places is naos this is something spiritual y'all this is talking about the saints of god he says i will dwell in them and walk in them and i will be their god and they shall be my people my brothers and sisters this is very simple if anybody is coming to you with a doctrine trying to tell you that the son of perdition is going to live and dwell in a literal temple that is built by some fake Jews over there in Palestine today, then they are teaching you false doctrine. With all that said, I like to say shalom. And as I always say, peace to my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus.